Welcome to 100 New Patients. Get ready to learn how to attract more ideal patients, fill your schedule, and maximize your production. Here's your host, Kent Sears. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to 100 New Patients. This is the online event. We have the opportunity to hear from some of the leading experts across the dental industry. Today, I'm joined by Trisha Casasanta. She's the Director of Operations at Strategic Practice Solutions. She has over 27 years of experience in the dental industry. She's uh, been a consultant, coach, trainer, and speaker, and her areas of expertise, uh, they are many, but they include practice management, leadership, HR, training, and development. So I'm super excited to have her here with us today. Trisha, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Kent. All right, excellent. Thank you. Um, thanks for being here. Why don't we start, I'll let you give a little more background about yourself, um, your experience in the industry, what and what you're working on today, just to let our viewers be a little more familiar with so. Okay, great. Oh, well, I'm just going to be dating myself here a little bit, but I've been in the industry since, oh gosh, probably 1988. I uh, started off in any phase of dentistry from front desk, assisting, hygiene to business. Um, so what I really have felt is a strong tool is going into offices and helping them succeed, um, developing programs so that we can increase performance of their team members and develop skills that they may not have and then helping doctors understand how it is that they need to run their practice and decide what kind of a culture they want to have in that practice. Excellent. Good. Well, I, I, you've had a lot of experience. And, you know, recently, one of the trends that we've heard a lot from dentists is that it's getting harder and harder to attract new patients to their practice. And I was wondering, do you mind sharing with us, you know, based on your experience, what you've seen and some of the reasons or things that are happening in the dental industry right now that may be causing this? That's a very good question, and it is ever dynamic. But just recently, um, some of the things that I think are really challenging to general practices is the fact that you've got these private equity funds coming into the marketplace. Uh, they're buying up a lot of these practices. So what it does is it allows them to leverage themselves a little bit better than a single provider. Uh, they're able to get more of a marketing edge. One thing that I find that patients are really looking for because of their time being so limited is having a dental office that is able to provide all phases of dentistry and these larger groups are able to offer that. So that's one thing. Another thing I think in the last two years has been very hard is finding the team members to join the practice with the communication <coughs> skills, the dental skill, the dental knowledge. That's become even more challenging in the last two years. I mean, it's not uncommon for doctors to say, Trisha, they're not showing up. You know, they come in for the interview, they don't even show up, they don't even call anymore. I mean, back in the day, they at least used to call. It's just the, uh, the workforce is totally different. And then now you have the changes that are happening with the insurance companies. You've got these rented networks. Not a lot of, I, I would have to say about 90% of the dental offices are not aware of them, so they're not as sure of how it's impacting their practice. Good. Uh, and so what are some of the things that dentists can do now to overcome those challenges? The most important thing is for a doctor, owner, and a team to identify what it is that they do. What is the patient base that they're looking for? And they have to take in consideration the geographic location that they're in. Yes, there are business systems. Yes, there are team cultures. They don't fit every practice. So they have to really identify, okay, if we're in this geographic location, then this is a better business model for us these are the systems we're going to implement and this is the skills and the competencies we need in the team to do that and this is how we're going to market that group um, again an office that's going to be in an inner city is probably going to run differently than an office that's in an affluent suburban area so they have to identify that and not try to be that dental practice that fits it all mm -hmm. i know one of the areas that you have expertise in and it's very critical is patient call conversion and team communication. So can you walk us through a little bit about what that ideal process looks like in terms of handling potential new patient calls and then actually converting them into new patients? What are the critical elements that a team should really be focused on to make that successful? Okay, um, question. And I'm gonna refer back to my previous comment. So let's say you're in an inner city and you've determined that you're going to go on volume because the income is low. Patients are going to be basically doing their immediate need. Yeah, you're going to have patients that are going to do beyond the scope of what they need, but that's few and in between. 
So that team is gonna handle call a lot faster. Their discovery intake, you patient calls, they're gonna say, okay, give me your number in case we get lost. What are your needs? Okay, here's how we can come in. And they're probably gonna have some kind of a uh, cancellation policy and say, hey, we're reserving this time in for you. If you should no show, it is a charge. Is, and they're probably gonna run three columns because there are gonna be no shows that are showing up for that particular practice. A practice that's more in an exclusive suburban area, they're gonna spend more time in the discovery. So the new patient intake comes in, they're gonna get all of their contact information and then they're gonna go into deeper. What are you looking for? What is your outcome? Uh, what kind of doctor are you looking for? And then they're gonna help fit them with the best provider in the practice and then schedule a time for them to come in. And when they do this, they're gonna have longevity. They're gonna show up and then got the whole view patient experience once they come into the office. Uh, great examples, great examples. Do you have maybe one or two other scenarios that you could share in, in how the process may differ? I mean, th those are two very um, different <laughs> examples, right? But there's a lot of practices that fit somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. And in particular cases, and one of the things that I pride our company on is that we track um, mutation calls when they come in. So by testing out different strategies and different um, art of communication and just an intake procedures, we're able to see what works the best. So the one that has worked the best from offices that are in the middle to the advanced is you do take time on that intake call. Intake call comes in from a new patient. You pretty much have a template that you can follow. And you're gonna ask them specific questions about why they're calling, what are the things that they're looking for when they're making a decision on a new dentist? Um, what are their short-term needs or long-term needs? And then you're going to take that information and you're gonna put it in the appointment time. So now when the patient comes in, all that time you spend on the phone now goes into handoff to the clinical team. So now when the patient shows up, you're gonna remember their scenario, they're gonna be impressed right out of the gate. By the time they go to the clinical team, the clinical team is going to refresh and now take it the next level over. The patients go, oh my gosh, they do communicate. So they're going to be impressed every step of the way. So in doing that kind of a system, having a specific intake call, having a template, jotting it down in the appointment, bringing it into the huddle, and making sure the clinical team and the administrative team are on the same page, all are good in building rapport and trust with the patient. And as you know, the patient has yeah. trust in you, they're more likely going to move forward with treatment. What, what are the most common mistakes that you see during this process uh, when you work with practices? What, what are the themes that keep coming uh, in terms of where the process goes wrong, where there's opportunity for improvement? Okay, you just want one or two, right? <laughs> you can give as many as you like, but one or two will work. Okay. Uh, the first thing, mistake that I see is that an office doesn't spend time in training or onboarding new hires um, into a system of some sort to follow. It just sets some new hire for a disadvantage or for failure. So that's the first mistake. Um, the second mistake that I see is that practices are trying to be the go-to for all people, and they really shouldn't. You should really find out what differentiates them and stick to that model and attract patients to that model. Okay, excellent. Um, you talked a little bit about the need for communication between the front office and the back office. Um, can you expand a little bit more? Why is that so critical today? Um, I'm pretty sure a lot of your listeners will probably attest to this. A patient will go in the back and they're seen by a clinical person and the clinical person will say, well, I'm going to be doing this on you today. And they'll say, that's not what I said. That's not what the front person said. So right off the gate, that causes a, um, an ear to the patient where do, do, do they really know what they're doing? Am I in good hands? So from a patient's perspective, they're becoming insecure now. From a team's perspective, the back office and the front office need to be able to communicate with each other so they seem like one seamless entity. So what can the, what can the doctor do as the leader of the practice to ensure that that communication is effectively happening? Obviously, there's a responsibility with the front office and there's a responsibility with the back office, clinical team, to make sure that that's working. But it, as the doctor, the leader of the practice, what can they specifically do? First, identifying the roles of each individual and what they're responsible for. So there's a level of accountability. So if something doesn't get done, they know who's the go-to person. 
Um, the second thing is to run effective, and I stress effective huddles, um, not the huddle where you come in and you're talking about the patient and what they did last time or how they, what car they drive. You're wanting to identify in the schedule where the hygienists are going through their schedule to identify treatment that needs to be done that was not done. They need to identify potential patients that may be um, SRPs instead of prophies. Mm -hmm. And it's a great way for if there's openings in the schedule that they fill in those openings. The assistants are identifying, hey, are the lab cases in for these patients that are coming down two or three days down the road so that if they're not in, they're able to um, troubleshoot that fairly quickly so the patient doesn't have to have that phone call, we gotta reschedule your appointment. So having huddles where that is happening amongst the team and then the financial team chiming in and saying, wait a minute, we can't see that patient. We haven't received payment from them yet. Let's, let us work on this first. Do not bring the patient back so that we can collect on it. So by doing that, the financial administrative team is also part of the communication between the clinical and the admins. Good, good. There's a ton of great stuff in there, very practical. Um, so fantastic. Anything else that you would want to tell our listeners about that, that process, patient call conversion and communication? Any other tidbits or pieces of advice that yeah. we can cover? Communication is key. I've spent probably the last eight years in developing my communication skills. And um, one thing that was really helpful was um, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. There's a certain way of communicating, not only team members, but with patients that are effective. Now, yes, we're all good communicators, but at one point in time, if you wanna be really effective, there needs to be some kind of training um, to the team to enhance those skills. And when you enhance those skills, the outcome is enhanced as well. Um, in fact, that's the reason why I got into this. I was uh, working in several dental offices, consultants would come in and say, you didn't hit your numbers, you didn't hit your numbers, you didn't hit your numbers. Okay, I got that. I'm still having the same skill, same knowledge, so how can I perform any differently? Once they started increasing my skill and my knowledge, my performance automatically went up. So with communication, it follows the same way. If you want higher case acceptance, you want new patient conversions, you have to develop those skills in order to get a different result or outcome. Absolutely, fantastic. So related topic, patient retention. Um, so getting once you have a patient in the office, um, you know, and they're having a great experience, what, what do you do, what's important to put in place to make sure that you're retaining that patient over time? Okay, first of all is follow through. So patient comes in, they get seen. So whether they get seen from a hygienist, there's I'm gonna do new patient dentist appointment and new patient hygiene appointment. So new patient hygiene appointment, patient comes in, you identify their need, they get their treatment. And then the way that you keep them in the system is you help the patient book their next cleaning appointment. I hear a lot of times patients saying, I can't do it now, I'm really busy. I'm gonna give you guys a secret phrase right now. Here goes, ready? When a patient tells you that, you say to them, in six months, what appointment do you have standing that I need to work your appointment around because I know how important this is to you. Perfect. That's one thing that they can do. Um, when it's coming down to the dentist and it's an emergency patient, yes, of course you're gonna take care of their immediate need. Once that immediate need is done, they really need to find out what is their long-term need and schedule them in for their hygiene appointment. Um, there's, it is remarkable to me when I go into offices how many of these new patient emergency appointments get lost in the shuffle once they get seen by the dentist. They don't come back in for their hygiene appointment. So just by doing those two things is very helpful. Um, the other thing is having a strategy when the team is approaching recall so in that point, having one person that is responsible for it, that way there is time made. If you don't have a person that's responsible for it, then schedule some block time in the schedule. Um, because as you and I know, when hygiene doesn't have a patient and there's openings in hygiene, it affects the dental schedule. When it affects the dental schedule, it affects the overall performance of the office. So the overall goal is to try to go ahead and keep hygiene filled. So if that's that important, there should be someone that is appointed to it or have blocks so that the team works on it as a whole. Um, and then approaching recall in a strategic manner. So 
Another thing that I share with people is, why are you gonna be calling people that are due four or five months out in the topic of people that are in the current month? So focus in on the people that are due in the current month, focus people that are due in the, pre the next month, and then slowly back up. So let's say today is what, July? You're gonna work on July, and then you're gonna work on August, and once you're done with those two, then you go back to May. How many people were past due in May? And then you slowly back up instead of handling this big, huge list. Yeah, the technology. So if you can find a way, um, I love texting uh, for last minute needs. If you can get technology to help out in the recall process, that's also essential. Good, good. What, um, can you give a couple examples of best practices and offices that you've worked with in terms of Things that they've done where you've seen really strong examples of patient retention, very specific things that you've seen in offices. So what did it look like? What was so special about it? Okay, pretty much everything that I've kind of stated, but there is my favorite office and the doctor prided himself on communication. So the first thing that he did is he identified what was the patient uh, persona that he was trying to attract into the office. And in doing the patient persona, he identified, this is our geographic location, here's what our patients are looking for, these are the patients we wanna work with. So what he found out in that evaluation is that the patient's communication was key, um, systems were key. So what he did is that he embarked in training with the team. So the hygienist had a certain training in learning how to approach patients and do what we call co-diagnosing. So they're co-diagnosing with the patient. So every step of the appointment, the patient is brought along in the appointment. Front people are taking new patient calls. They're following a system where they're having the patient kind of go into a Q&A session with them in a discovery session. So they're building a relationship so that patient retains their appointment. Um, he did the same thing with the treatment coordinator. So every department had that. Um, and then what they did, they met weekly and monthly. So weekly, they would talk about how did the week go at the end of the week on a monthly basis. Hey, what did we do this? Month? What are we projected to do next month? What are some of the things that we're going to implement? Um, so that communication between their team was very essential for them. And implementing the huddle was huge. Good. Good. Um, do you see a, a link between an effective patient retention system and, and in turn driving new patient growth down the road? Do those, are those two concepts linked? By, by holding on to patients, do you, do you see a stronger um, sense in effectiveness from internal marketing? Yes, I mean, you're gonna have that, and that's part of, um, thank you. Um, part of the things that that other office did is that every time we would ask for referrals, but it has to be a genuine felt referral. It can't be, you're just saying it on the cuff type of thing. But when you can have an internal referral system and you maintain, maintain the patients that you have at hand, that tells you your business systems are working great. When you start noticing that that isn't happening, then you know some of the systems are broken. And then you have your new patients coming in and that's how practice actually grows, is that retaining new patient, current patients obtaining new patients and maintaining those new patients, then you'll have growth. If a practice is not growing in their hygiene, then one of those systems is broken. Excellent. All right, let's talk about one other topic. Uh, in, I know you're an expert in this area, rented networks insurance coverage. And so I'm gonna let you just start and kind of give an explanation, because I think this is maybe a concept that not everyone's entirely familiar with, at least the inside and, and out. Uh, so I'll let you talk a little bit about what that is, and then um, I'll, I'll bring up some, some slides that, for our audience to help walk them through the discussion. Okay, so first of all, I'm gonna preface, I am only the deliverer of the news. I did not create the rented network, so I'm just tossing it out there first of all. All right, so, so it's my what is happening out, and it's been happening in the last year or two, but a lot of the offices, like I said, about 90% of the dental practices are not aware of this. You have insurance companies that are leasing out their program to other insurance companies. What that does is it allows that insurance company to access to the patient to widen their patient base. Um, and then the other thing is they're able to use that original insurance's fee schedule. So the reason that this affects dental offices, just to give you a hypothetical, um, one would be Assurant. 
Assurance is in a rented network with uh, United Cordia and with Aetna. So let's say a doctor is out of network and they decided, well, I'm just gonna get in direct contract with Assurance. Then all of a sudden their claims are coming back paid by either Aetna, patients that have Aetna insurance or patients that have United Concordia and they're confused. I'm not in direct contract with these two companies. Why am I being paid off on them and I have to write off the difference? And the reason is, is because they went into a direct assurance, assurance in a rented network with these two other companies. So that one dental office who thought that they were basically just in network with assurance is actually in network with all three, assurance, United Concordia, and that. And is this becoming more prevalent and how prevalent is it right now? Very prevalent. Um, and it's to the point where you have to understand the rented networks. Um, because when we're dealing with our clients, we are able to increase their patient base as we increase their knowledge. Yet, at the same time, you have to understand the fee schedules because if you're in the rented network, you have to figure out: Am I joining this network through Assurance? Am I going to join it through Aetna, or am I going to join it through United Concordia? And the answer is the one that gives you the highest fee schedule. So you have to figure out how you can get that high fee schedule and you could definitely leverage it to your benefit. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Well, uh, is it okay if I bring up the slides? And Absolutely. We'll start walking yeah. through this? Okay. Okay, great. Okay. All right, so um, I'll, I'll let you kind of take us through some of the details here, but um, yeah, so a little bit more <laughs> background information on this topic. <laughs> Okay, so let's just start with the preface. A new patient calls and they will say, hey, are you in, in network with, well, let's just use Assurance. And the doctor office says, no, I am not. In theory, they may be. So besides, you know, and a lot of times they'll tell the patient, well, you can still come to us. We can still see you. But patients are becoming more aware that they understand if they go to an out-of-network doctor, they have to pay out of pocket. Um, there's a huge percentage of patients that realize that maybe they can get a really good doctor that is in network and not have to pay out of pocket. So because of the internet, patients are more aware of this. It would behoove a doctor to find out, first of all, which contracts do they have a direct contract with. That means which doctors are in contract with, let's say, Assurance, and what is their fee schedule. The second thing is by being in direct contract with that insurance, are they also in other rented networks that they may not be aware of? Um, there's doctor offices that just went to town and when they got their associates in, they signed up with every single insurance group. But by doing that, they actually have decreased their ability of increasing their fees by 24% because one of the rented networks has put a little stop on that process, which when we go through the next slides, I'll go over that with you. Um, so really you want to identify which, you want to be strategic, you want to know which companies you want to be in direct contract with, which ones do you want to be in a rented network with, and which ones you don't want to have any involvement at all. And by doing that, you can definitely increase your new patient stream, but also have a really good, decent fee schedule. Excellent. Okay. Let's move on. Next slide. So this is an example of an office that has multiple providers. On the left side, um, you'll see that at the top it says providers. They're, those are their initials. Uh, it tells you the location and it tells you their tax ID. Uh, one of the processes that we do right out of the gate is we do validation. We want to know how these providers are in a specific insurance. What is their relationship with a specific insurance? And as you can tell right underneath for Aetna, you have one doctor that is is underneath the G1G fee schedule. One is not in network at all. The other one is, I would say, Aetna 515 plan, and another one is underneath the 565 plan. So in understanding that, we're able to tell them what is going on. So one of the things that the doctors should realize is understand what, how each one of their providers are in contract with a specific insurance company. Okay, great, great deal, great deal. <laughs> Okay, and tell us a little bit about this one. And the re reason you wanna do that is portrayed in this slide here. So let's just talk about principle first. Principle does what's called tiering. What's involved with tiering is that you see all those insurance companies listed right below principle, Kent? Yep. Well, what happens is principle will say, 
is this doctor in direct contract with principal? If the answer is yes, they will pay on that fee schedule. These are all the rented networks that are in network with principal. Then they'll say, well, are they with diversity? If answer to no, they're not in direct contact with principal, they go to the next one in line. Are they with diversified services? If your answer is no, are they with the mirror test? If your answer is no, are they in with dental health? If your answer is no, are they in with United Concordia? If the answer is no, then they go to Denimax. The majority of the doctors that I've come across are in network with Denimax at different fee schedules. So if they're in network with Denimax, principal will pick up on the Denimax fee schedule because they're in a rented network. Okay, there's the DHA assurance, same thing with DHA. So if you are in network with DHA, how they pay is in a tier. They will say, okay, are you in network with DHA? If your answer is no, we'll go to Aetna. Are you in network with Aetna? Yes. So DHA will pick up on the Aetna fee schedule. The one that's different is Blue Cross Blue Shield. Blue Cross Blue Shield does what's called cherry picking. So there's what's called the best value practice. So let's say um, Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith is in direct contract with Denimax. They're in direct contract with Carrington and direct contract with Connection Dental. The fee schedules for Denimax are probably the lowest. Then there's Connection Dental and then Carrington is the highest fee schedule. When a patient comes in with a Blue Cross Blue Shield claim and the doctor is looking at it, Blue Cross Blue Shield will say, which one of these three has the lowest fee schedule? And they will pick you up on the lowest fee schedule. And then same thing with Lincoln Financial. So this is just to give you an idea of, you can be in either a company through or insurance group either directly or in a rented network or maybe not at all. Excellent, okay, good. So definitely a complex topic, no question. I appreciate it, but that's definitely providing some uh, clarity. Um, okay, so this is an example of, as you're negotiating out fees, so this is a great example, Connection Dental. Connection Dental is not an insurance company. It basically holds several insurance companies beneath its wing. It's in a rented network. It has principal, Aetna, Assurance. So when you register, and trust me, I've learned this through trials and tribulations, Kent. It's not something that came to me overnight. So you're gonna be in with Connection Dental. You're gonna sign up because you're gonna think I'm gonna get all these new patients because they are in rented networks with all this insurance, right? So they give you a fee schedule, you like it, it's great. Well, here's what happens. Let's say your patient comes in and they have DHA and Assurant. DHA and Assurant pays on a tier. So where is United Concord or Connection Dental on that list? The fourth one, right? So in order for that patient's insurance to pay on that Connection Dental fee schedule that you're so proud of getting, you cannot be in a DHA, you cannot be in that night, and you cannot be in United Concordia to get that special fee that you got. Okay because these insurance pay on tiers. Yeah. Life, where is Connection Dental on that list? Mm -hmm. Number five. But the fifth one. So you better not be in MetLife, you better not be in Stratos, you better not be in Denimax, you better not be in Caring T for you to get that special fee that you arrange with Connection Dental. So a doctor who goes into these insurances thinking they're gonna get all these patients in, yes but you gotta be very careful to find out you don't wanna get them at a very, very low fee schedule because of this tiering process that's going on. Got it, okay, very, very eye-opening. <laughs> Another example okay. you wanna walk us through? Well, this is a financial example. So this is so something that the doctors and the managers can put their arms around. So there's Guardian Insurance, right? So an office can be a network with Guardian. They can balance bills. So they can, patient comes in, they get seen, patient pays, the insurance pays, and then the patient pays whatever the insurance doesn't cover. They can be in network, so they can be underneath a direct contract, and they can have a specific fee that they're gonna be paid for a service, or they can be in a rented network, either Denimax, Connection, or Carrington. The next slide will give you an example of how this works out. So let's say we're gonna look at a crown. In Guardian, if you're out of network, let's say that crown is $1,300. If you're in network, let's say you negotiated out a fee for $915. And if you're in a rented network, there's Aetna that pays at $1,096, Connection at $916, and Carrington at $1,049. So depending on how you leverage yourself, we'll show you the outcome. So the next slide. 
So let's say we got a situation where we see 20 crowns, or the patient, or the practice, sorry, completes 20 crowns for a month. If you're out of network, that fee is 1300. So by the end of the month, that's 26,000 in production. And let's look at Carrington. Carrington, their fee is 1,000. So at the end of the month, they have about 20,980 in The difference from Guardian is that you're getting 1% from your normal schedule. And from Aetna, you're right. So in this case here, you would want to be in network with Aetna and not with Guardian in the rented network. Okay. All right. So that is just an example of that. Uh, this is the last example is MetLife. Same thing. You can be either out of network, you can be in good contract, or you can go through a rented network. If you're through a rented network, then that means you're open to Denimax, Connection, or Maverest. Um, let's look at what those fees are. Now, every office is different depending on their geographic location, but this is for a specific office that we looked at. Um, their out of network was 1300, in network was 647 for the same crown that we just talked about in Guardian. And through the rented networks, they're a little bit higher. Denimax covered it at 878, Connection at 916, and Maris at 948. So, what does that mean when you look at it at the end of the month? So in this particular case, if they're doing 20 crowns a month, the out of network is gonna be around 26,000 in production. And then you can see for Maver or MetLife Connection and Mavericks, uh, what it would total up for the month. The difference is if you're in the rented network through MetLife, you're writing off 50% of production. If you went in through Mavericks, you're writing off 27%. Where would you rather be? <laughs> Not a hard question. <laughs> and you know, and you know what else is? This is happening, but the doctors are not aware of it. They just feel like they're they're victims of the system. But in this particular case, the reason that I was attracted to the rented networks as a service that we provide for our clients is that you know trying to be strategic and leverage that information or that playing field could make a difference of today and a fee schedule of 24% higher and a more new patients. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So what, what are some things that doctors can do to help work through this challenge? I mean, is this something that you recommend they address on their own or do they look to someone on their team or do they look for outside expertise? How do they attack this problem? This is, this is a significant financial burden. Right. If there was a course that I could teach to tell the doctors on how to do this, I would do it in a heartbeat. There's, it's just, it's an ever evolving and changing system or methodology. So even with my team and I, every month, we're constantly learning more and more and more and we're, we're implementing it. So yes, the doctor can do it on its own, um, but it took us a long time to figure out what's going on. I mean, the thing that you saw on those, those screens, those charts, took literally three months of several, several calls to the same insurance company to get that information. So they can take the information we did today. First thing they can do is check to see if they're in direct contract um, or if they're in a rented contract, just calling the insurance companies and asking, how are we in network? What fee schedule are you paying off of? The part that they're gonna struggle with is understanding how the rented networks work. So if that's something that they wanna outsource it to another company or call us, we be more than happy to help them understand that part of it. Excellent. Thank you, Trisha. That's fantastic information. I'm sure that's incredibly valuable to a lot of people out there listening. I understand for those that want to get in contact with you, though, and, and potentially learn more, that you have an offer available. Do you mind telling us a little bit about that? Yes. As, as far as the offer goes, we'd like to take a look at a complimentary evaluation of an insurance of a, of a practice insurance, and that means how much of the patient base is associated with the top six insurance companies, and then identify if there is a way that they can strategically reappoint those so that they have a higher fee schedule of about 24% or greater. Excellent, excellent. And how would someone uh, reach out to you or take advantage of that offer? We'll, we'll provide, for those watching uh, below in the video description, there's a URL, but Trisha, is there a way that they can uh, contact you other than that? Yes, they can actually call our toll-free number. It's 
421-1808, or they can email me directly at tcasasanta at spsolutionteam.com. Okay, excellent. And for those of you listening, if you didn't catch it the first time, that information is provided below in the video description. So you can uh, contact Tricia via email, via phone, uh, and, and there's also the URL. So I really hope you take advantage of that. I think that is a great offer, especially considering this topic and, and everything we discussed and the complexity involved here with insurance. Tricia, thank you so much for sharing your information on this topic. Anything else that you want to leave our listeners with before we wrap up? Not at this time, but I will, hopefully I will be able to con be contacted by a few offices so that I can hear their stories and see if we can be of assistance. That's good. Thank you so much. And I hope everyone out there take advantage of that offer. It's fantastic. Trisha, thank you so much for being with us, for sharing your knowledge on this subject. We really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you so much, Kent. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening.